I'd like to share with you uh, why my colleagues and I felt this was a theme of vital importance. Probably like many of you, when we look at the data, we are persuaded that we face a future of volatility. We anticipate abrupt changes in biophysical states that disrupt sociopolitical systems, such as severe drought. And we're further persuaded that the current scientific way of knowing is causal to these systemic conditions. So a science's usual path means, as Jim Hansen has said, that the planetary conditions that support cooperative human existence will no longer be in place in the lifetimes of our grandchildren. So we've proposed this theme out of the engineering professional mandate to prioritize societal well-being over all other considerations. So what is it? Um, In a nutshell, what we are suggesting is that we live in a world of dynamic complexity and reductionist science that works well in a laboratory neither applies to this world nor enables us to effectively work with it. And we must develop a new science of working in the real world. So essentially taking uh, science out of the laboratory and into the world in a way that's consistent with our ethical mandates. Now, a dilemma that I have is that Uh, you know, we are all products of the current scientific worldview. And uh, that means that our, our thinking, we're going to hear things in a particular way that our mental models are, uh, when they encounter something that doesn't uh, fit with that, those mental models are just sort of going to reject the idea. Uh, So I sort of accept the fact that I'm going to sound like a heretic when I present some of these ideas. So having said that, I'll go ahead and get started. Greetings. Uh, My name is Moon Unit, and I have time traveled from the year 2065 to thank you for leading this important area of research. You had no way of knowing this, but uh, initiating this research was like the flapping of the butterfly wings that caused 50 years of global transformation things you would never have thought possible. For example, I'm happy to tell you that we've been celebrating decades of world peace in a post-carbon economy, and the innovative capacity that came out of this research enabled rapid stabilization and revitalization of planetary life support systems. I know this sounds impossible to you. That's why I've come back through time to tell you about it. Now, how did this happen? Let's, Let's review how this change came about, a little history together. You know that scientists have always been, always been interested in change, and their conception of change um, they took from the classical science. Um, Newton asserted that uh, in order to get change, you must actually apply a force. So this led uh, in the Western um, concept of science to this force-based change model. And a kind of corollary to that was that productivity required the application of force. Now, this, this model, um, it, it's not crazy, but it, it really reduces the scope of analysis to the very localized um, f- cause and effect interactions between what looks like an object and its environment. When one stands back, one could see that there is, a, in fact, a dynamic recursive interaction with, between the object and, and the environment. Nevertheless, this change model got embedded in... Um, in the, in the Western conception of, of science, this reductionist science, which comes with it the tendency to neglect the larger systemic uh, dynamics. So, um, and this had some, uh, some consequences that were unintended. Let's consider an example. As you know, your mission as an organization was er, to promote the progress of science. And so naturally, you supported scientific research and education, investing in institutions. And there were a few casualties along the way. But for the first 20, 30 years, tremendous advances in science and engineering were made, arguably to lead the the world in uh, technology. And what you noticed was that the graduate stream in engineering didn't exactly reflect the society it was intended to serve. So from the institutional investments, you 
refocused on uh, this time investments in students to diversify the field. And it didn't exactly turn out as it was intended. And when you ask the faculty why, their response was, well, not everyone who chooses engineering is meant to be an engineer. Uh, you know, we really need to weed out those who are uh, not naturally good at engineering or not naturally interested in engineering. What was sort of forgotten was that the engineering curriculum itself was not natural, uh, but in fact designed by, for, and about these guys. So um, while they believed they were, um, you know, upholding a, a meritocracy and, and upholding the merits of the field, they were in fact producing a meritocracy. Uh, now, there's nothing inherently wrong with these guys. In fact, from a system's point of view, the system was functioning perfectly as designed by them. Uh, but the design of the curriculum, like all designs, reflect the limits of the designer's attention. So what was the quality of that attention? Well, um, it wasn't till the early 21st century that you saw that from the neuroscientists, uh, the, that part of the brain that was prioritized in the STEM curricula uh, was uh, odd in the sense that it had a very narrow focus on abstraction, quantization, and then inan inanimate objects. And um, so in such a way that um, the sort of prioritization of this part of the brain meant that the that once this part of the brain was developed, it actually couldn't quite literally see things outside of its attentional span. And as a result, anything outside that a scope of attention was therefore less important or not important than what their intention was on. So you realize that this process of enculturation uh, through what these guys thought was uh, something called rigor uh, constrained the learner's attention in a particular way. And what they meant by rigor, of course, was the preservation of the things that they had their attention on. Um, you also uh, learned in the early 21st century that the focus of the STEM curriculum was a kind of stressful environment. And what the neuroscience was pointing to was that these, that the, that these stressful environments, these chronic stressful environments, were um, making molecular modifications on the genome, the, on the epigenome of the, of the learner. So the DNA wasn't changed, but these these epigenomic modifications were active in DNA transcription in a way that you know had them highlight or redact information in the in the genome that was linked to a number of disorders including things like uh, disorders of attention and the inability to self-regulate negative emotion so you also learned that um, these epigenomic modifications were passed down three generations. So ironically, you learned that this emphasis on STEM was uh, causing many of the patterns that occurred as problems, such as the not invented here syndrome that was in the engineering culture, and the, the intransigent curriculum that resulted in disinterest in STEM by young people and a lack of diversity in the, the STEM graduates particularly in engineering, and possibly was linked to this, the, the research data that showed there's lower progress in moral reasoning amongst engineering students compared to their peers. So this wasn't exactly good news in the sense that you're in a fixes that fail dynamic. Um, so, uh, you know, starting out under your mandate for uh, promoting science, you called for more STEM. The odds were good that you'd accomplish that goal, but the goods were odd um, in the sense of their attention being uh, fixated on certain things. Uh, you then called for not just increase in quantity, but a, a change in quality. But one of the difficulties was your process for changing the quality involved consulting these guys. And of course, their attention was constrained in a way that they couldn't understand or value the things that you were calling for. So, but you felt you were stuck, so you made more fervent calls, uh, maybe a more forceful calls in a, a, a force-based change model, calls for transformative uh, change. Meanwhile, you learned from the neuroscientists that intelligence is a, is a property that arises out of the whole human body as a complex biophysical system dynamically interacted w interacting with its social political environment. 
this whole notion of the brain as a central processing unit ha was breaking down. And they were pointing to the fact that intelligence is a distributed property in the human body. That in fact, there are a higher density of neurons in the heart and in the stomach than in the cranial brain. So um, you saw that, well, okay, tr traditional STEM curricula had the unintended consequence of neglecting this more holistic development. But maybe that's just the cost of progress, you thought. You know, what's the real benefit of full body intelligence anyway? Well, uh, in 2014, there was a study out of Harvard that um, gave you your answer. They looked at the changes in brain for morphology before and after an eight-week intervention on, in, a, in a mindfulness practice. There's a lot going on in these images. These are just showing cross sections of the um, the brain, um, and the important part to see here is that these these yellow bright yellow regions indicate regions where uh, there was significant increase in the density of neurons after the eight weeks practice in mindfulness. So what they found is that this this practice. Uh, caused significant um, increase in, in neuron density in the brainstem. And not only that, these increases were correlated to uh, changes in psychological well-being. Uh, six measures, but I'll highlight a few here. Uh, they were things like the ability to see one's own limitations and accept them non-judgmentally. Um, the uh, sort of meaning that one makes out of their endeavors in life, personal growth, and the ability to create and maintain um, positive, trusting relationships with other people. And these were correlated with changes in brain morphology in the brainstem that were associated with learning and attention, with um, relaying of contextual information, so not narrow focus, but looking uh, at the context. And then also with the regulation of what is, was normally called unconscious processes in the body or somatic intelligence. So what this, this research told you was essentially that it appeared that the STEM curriculum, uh, when it's really neglecting this this broader development, is essentially undermining uh, the development of the the whole intelligence that would make meaning, meaningful the STEM uh, curriculum, studying STEM. Uh, also, it would promote collaboration and uh, creativity. So, this result had you thinking that, well, maybe more STEM is not more STEM, but there is maybe a hint from the cosmos of a, a different So the pattern was clear that these mindfulness practices, which are practices in consciously managing one's attention, um, promote brain stem development in a way that is uh, linked to enhanced psychological well-being. But when you look into the current STEM curricula, what you see is they more or less consist of mindless practices uh, of uh, reproducing known solutions to very narrow technological problems, uh, which results in a kind of limit of the attention and the undermining of these traits and states that would um, would help the engineer be effective in um, addressing you know grand challenges. Now you could see that the science as usual in the engineering curricula affects the biophysical development in a way that limits the sociopolitical effectiveness and you were convinced that you needed systemic transformation. So looking at your um, investment portfolio, what you saw is that when you compared this against Donello Meadows' a hierarchy of systemic interventions, the lower leverage interventions were well represented, but the higher leverage interventions weren't. So um, you decide to um, take a, a gamble on this theme that is around paradigm shifts. And it turned out to be a, a good bet because in the year 2065, every child knows that the universe, in fact, is a complex dynamic system, which is fractal in nature with nested 
complex dynamic systems at different scales or different levels of organization. Um, th such systems are ones in which the parts are recursively interacting with one another and the environment, resulting in a nonlinear behavior and um, an unpredictable behavior. You could see that the, that the spontaneous changes in state um, arise uh, through a process that's called emergence, and emergence means to come into existence from the whole. So science as usual couldn't really predict or enable one to work with these phenomena. Um, you know, no more understanding of the reductionist understanding of, say, the wing or the beak will get one to uh, a place of understanding um, this, this process of emergence or working with it because it happens through a different change process. Well, in your time, these change processes were evident in the biophysical world. They're not a force-based change, but it's this different mechanism. They're also present in the sociopolitical world um, in events such as the Berlin Wall coming down or um, the Arab Spring uprising or the legalization of same-sex marriage. And um, leading up to these events, they, they seemed impossible. So these state changes, uh, what we know now, they happen spontaneously. And the, a better sort of analog to these are chemical reactions. And in a chemical reaction, w the reactants are in close proximity to one another. And the temperature and pressure conditions are such that it promotes the spontaneous uh, change of state, where the final state has fundamentally, radically different properties and behavior than the initial state. So when you started this research, your first question was, what conditions support transformational change in transdisciplinary contexts? Okay, the transdisciplinary context you stipulated because you looked around and saw that engineering design um, it takes place in a system where, so for, for example, um, the engineering grand challenges, you have a, a collision of the biophysical world and the socio-political dynamics. And so, of course, that would involve uh, experts from, you know, multiple widely different epistemological traditions. It would involve government, you know, families, businesses, advocacy groups, children, um, uh, legislators, and just the general prop populace. Um, this was a, a context that tr transcended boundaries, um, the, the boundaries between disciplines, the boundaries between uh, institutions and the boundaries between the social boundaries between the scientists and the and the layperson. Uh, this was a transdisciplinary context and one that is by definition a complex, dynamic, sociopolitical system. So you recognize this as the context of of the design uh, in the 21st century, particularly for uh, grand challenges. And uh, so one of your questions was, what methods and skillful means support emergence? of collaborative innovation in transdisciplinary contexts. So it turned out that you did fund a pilot study in, in uh, transdisciplinary, and this study involved around 200 students in, uh, 200 freshmen from over 30 different majors, over 20 different organizations in the region that were hosting over 40 different um, community uh, projects are, uh, organized around sustainability, and um, a number of faculty that were from STEM and non-STEM disciplines. And the primary research question here was, what what does it take to bring forth transformative education in a system that's optimized for something else? And this uh, pilot study was of interest to you because essentially they were facing the same challenge that you're facing. What does it take to bring forth radical innovation inside a conservative system. And by conservative, I don't mean politically conservative, but uh, conservative in the sense of preserving existing ways uh, of doing things. So um, what these researchers saw was that they were working in an institution that was a complex, dynamic, sociopolitical system. And they drew from the work of Gunderson and Holling, which was around uh, ecosystems. Uh, well, what they saw were the parallels that in that in a in a sociopolitical system, there's a natural uh, cycle where the resources um, are connected and, and um, used in a particular way. It goes through phases of conservation and then maybe collapse where resources are released. There's a reorganization or innovation phase and then a new cycle of exploitation and, and conservation. 
they were able to use this uh, metaphor of dynamic complexity to navigate the changing sociopolitical landscape in which the opportunity context for change varies throughout the cycle. Um, when they started the research, they, they uh, started with a partnership of the, current, the existing provost. Um, they were credited with the release of $5 million locally for innovation. Um, the president provost and five of six deans were replaced in the, during the course of the research, and um, the research ended in a complete cycle where there was a, a new power regime in place and a new conservation phase. So um, complexity metaphors help them sense and navigate uh, the changing sociopolitical landscape. And the results were that the students um, reported a radically different relationship to their education, a new ownership of their learning, behavioral shifts to deeper learning practices, and a vital encounter with their intrinsic desire to learn. Um, the alumni became compelling, a, a compelling leadership presence on the campus and in the local community. The researchers' partnership with the agencies was actually credited with um, seeding a number of systemic community change initiatives around sustainability, in particular energy and food. And the STEM faculty reported significant transformational shifts in their identity, which propagated out into permanent changes in their practice. These results were arguably transformative, and they were so effective that the beneficiaries that were drawing power from the existing traditional system made several unsuccessful attempts, force-based attempts, to stop the research throughout the five-year period. They learned a number of things, including the, the fact that their, their transdisciplinary social container was a microcosm of the institution. And very importantly, this container had the property of diversity in the sense of uh, world views. Without diversity, the conditions for strong emergence don't exist. So if this were a STEM-only um, effort, uh, these, uh, the results would be very different and em emergence was less likely to take place. Now, they did encounter a number of emergent states each annual cycle of the research, which was interesting because 75% of the participants were new each, each year of the, um, of the work. So this, the pattern of these emergent states were um, conflict, existential crisis, transformational, and then uh, transformation, and then a new vitality. So a pattern of these emergent states. Now, from the point of view of the force-based change model, these state changes would be viewed as a sign of some sort of incompetence on the researchers. Um, you know, certainly existential crisis is not an efficient. Uh, type of uh, development that it's it might be viewed as something wrong. One might attempt to use force to control the initiative to a particular outcome, or maybe even abort the activity before the transformation took place. However, through the lens of complexity, these emergent states were a natural part of the transformational process, and the stem faculty, uh, well, all the faculty, uh, report that the, this transformational process involved the whole of their lives. Uh, there was emotional upheaval, a nervous breakdown, a resignation of an 18-year career, engagements, marriage, divorce, adoption, professional failure. Uh, there was a self-induced brain hemorrhage. There were hospitalizations and an audit by the IRS. One person, after raising three children in a 28-year marriage, realized they were, in fact, gay. So the research didn't exactly cause these, uh, this upheaval in their life. It demonstrated that the force-based change model, using force in their own lives, was active in repressing their own natural state. And um, so they intended to transform the system outside themselves when they started believing the system needed to change. But what they found, in fact, was that the system, the system ethos the, was, in fact, embodied in their own lives and active in their own lives and the things that they were doing as participants and beneficiaries of the system. So the takeaway was that systemic transformation means transformation of the self. Now, as great as these results were, um, there was something missing, and that 
led you back to this work and uh, this third question, what is the role of holistic neurological intelligence in fostering the emergence of socially beneficial innovation? So your choice to, to choose this, uh, this theme uh, of research had many, many beneficial outcomes, and I will just leave you with three. First of all, that this research created a new science of collaborative transdisciplinary innovating praxis. It also uh, seeded the, the capability so that humanity was able to overcome the grand challenges in engineering. And for those who are focused on you know, shorter term wins, it also enabled you to achieve the uh, performance goal from your recent strategic plan. And everyone loves equations, so I put an equation in here. I know I represent the Earth's entire community from 2065 to thank you for leading the research in emergence in complex biophysical and sociopolitical systems. May you live long and prosper. Okay, I, I realized far too late that I had failed to understand my audience and the needs that they had. Uh, or afterwards, they said things like, you know, what you're talking about is really important, but it's a bit vague. Can you talk about what kind of projects you would do? What would the, what would the science look like? Would you be working with neuroscientists doing MRI scans, or, or what exactly would you be doing? And uh, I really misunderstood the purpose of my being there. I thought it was more a dialogue around science, um, although I, I responded with by saying things like um, some ideas that we had talked about uh, at my institution with my colleagues. Uh, I, I talked about uh, there being three axes of intervention, the, the uh, institutional axis, the student axis and then the faculty axis and that uh, two of them the institutional and the student axis have been tried but the faculty axis was underexplored and i could imagine uh, a uh, project where faculty worked in transdisciplinary projects in partnership with practitioners uh, in um, innovation and then also perhaps neuroscientists as uh, partners to validate the biophysical changes that were taking place while the transdisciplinary group learned how to work in dynamic complexity on the research questions that I had suggested. Um, I think it's sort of ironic that I failed to understand or really failed to consider their needs more deeply given the topic of what I was talking about. If I had to do it all over again, I think what I would do is just go over, go in and ask them what it was that they saw in the abstract submission and why did they, why did they ask me to come out and talk to them? And then maybe had a conversation from there. Um, I think that's what I would do. <laughs>